Legends of Wasteland City is a post-apocalyptic anthology series and may contain references to drugs, sex, and violence along with the occasional vulgarity. You've been warned. Dukes of the Nuke, The Ones Who Came Before, Chapter 5. Mutt and Zinn kept moving for a few miles, mixing their pace between jogging and walking. Another seven mile marker signs, at least the few that still remained, and they'd be at the turnoff to the Duke's camp. They needed to keep some distance between them and the bloodbacks that would be out looking for whoever just blew up all their vehicles. Mutt thought that if Zinn hadn't been there, they may never have even known he was in the camp, let alone took anything. Then again, he wouldn't have known about the bolt cutters and been able to bust the lock leaving him empty-handed. So do those raiders really kill your family? Not just my whole family. My whole... tribe. Everyone. We had a small cattle ranch west of here, near the old airport. There used to be a few farms there a long time ago, and we were able to get some of the old wells working. A few of those raiders used to come by and barter for milk, meat, leather, the usual just like everyone else. We had no idea they were bloodbacks. They looked like any other outlander. Well, a few weeks ago, they came back with the whole clan. A hundred of them, at least. They didn't ask questions, didn't even make any demands. They just started shooting that machine gun that we just burned and killed everyone on sight. I was working out in the fields at the time, but I saw it all happen. Zinn stopped, holding back a tear. I'm so sorry. I tried to run back, but one of the raiders cut me off on his motorcycle. He took off his helmet, and I recognized him right away. He was one of the traitors. He told me to lay down, so I did. And he said, stay here or they'll kill you too. And he fired a shot near me but missed. That was the man in the dirt back there. He let you live, and they killed him for it. <laughs> yeah, he still deserved to die. That bastard led them to us, and they took everything. I mean everything. By the time they left, they burned our homes, killed whatever stock they didn't take. Not that it even matters anymore. There's no one left. There were 37 of us. We were peaceful. We were just trying to make a life in this fucked up world. Mutt looked ahead. What could he say? The Bloodbacks had used Duke's weapons to help desolate Zinn's entire tribe. He felt to blame. The low rumble of a distant dirt bike broke the awkward silence. Mutt looked up at the guardrail that lined the Old Needles Freeway. If he could see the road, someone on the road could see them. He looked ahead and saw that about a hundred yards up, there was an overpass. Come on! He started running. They sprinted together and saw that the overpass led the highway over a dry wash. In the spring, these desert washes would flow with water from snowpack melt or the random rainfall this area got. But right now, it was dry as dust. It was dust. They ducked under the low bridge just as the dirt bike drove overhead. It was moving slow, but kept going right past them. Lucky break. For now, but we gotta get away from this highway. There'll be more behind him. They waited until the dirt bike was out of earshot and continued the rest of the way under the bridge, crossing to the other side of the old freeway. From here, they could follow the wash north over the rocky hills and then head east across the desert until they reached the trail leading to the Duke's camp. It wasn't the easiest route, but it got them far from the freeway and they'd be harder to see in the wash. They each took a last swig from Mutt's canteen, emptying the last drop as the sun was starting to get hot in the sky. If they weren't being hunted by a whole army of raiders, they could have stayed under the bridge until it got cool again. But they had to keep moving, water or not. Walking through the wash was a lot harder than the trail along the highway, which had been worn solid by travelers constantly using the route. Most wastelanders knew to stay off the main roads, but the paths next to them were a little safer. In the open dirt of the wash, there was soft sand and rocks, making for uneven terrain, but still easier than walking through the rocky turf above the wash, where the random cactuses and spike plants would pierce right through your clothes. They'd always leave a sore spot on your leg, so it was best to make your way well around them. They moved slower than before. 
but each step took them further from the highway, where they'd be easily seen. After an hour of following the wash, they found themselves in the boulders of the foothills. Hiking up between the rocks, they spotted a shady hollow from where one boulder had rolled down the hill, maybe a thousand years ago, and came to rest on another, creating a sort of cave. It was cooler inside, and they decided this was a good place to take a quick break out of the sun. Mutt left Zinn sitting in a rock in the cave, where she started letting the sand out of her well-worn shoes, and walked back down around the rocks they had just passed. He could see the highway, and where they were stopped was well in cover, and there wasn't a raider in sight. He went back under the rock where Zinn was now laying with her head propped on a small round stone, and pulled out the last of his MREs to share. This one was beef goulash, which just meant meat and vegetables as far as Mutt could tell. But this pack came with peanut butter and strawberry jam, applesauce, snack breads, and a dessert labeled Patriotic Sugar Cookies. Zinn loved the peanut butter and strawberry jam, so Mutt let her have both packets to herself, along with the snack breads. He ate most of the goulash, which Zinn found pretty repulsive. I'll stick to these things. <laughs> I guess it would be pretty bad if you've been eating fresh cattle meat your whole life. They shared the applesauce, since it was the closest thing they had to water right now, along with the sugar cookie. Patriotic. It's got a flag on it. There weren't many American flags left, at least none that anyone flew anymore. The survivors had long lost hope in the government rebuilding around here a long time ago. They'd heard about a few areas out east where the United States of America still existed, but no one Mutt knew had ever seen it firsthand. The California Republic was the closest thing to a governed territory around here, but the Dukes kept their distance from them. Something about taxes and lawmen was not so attractive to a band of ex-mercenary gunrunners. But tribes like Zins welcomed the prospect of joining the Republic, who fought back against the raider clans that took over after the fall of the American government from the old times. The Republic had been slowly moving into Barstown, just a few miles west of Zinn's ranch, but they didn't have the numbers yet to do much of anything against the raider clans that dotted the wasteland in every direction from there. If Zinn's tribe had held on for another few years, maybe they would have been in the Republic's borders. But that didn't matter now. Mutt held out his half of the patriotic cookie. They say it was a paper tower, the old America. Once the thing fell, it just kept crashing down. I heard it was the war that everyone lost. War, then plague, famine. One thing led to another until there was nothing left. They both bit into their half of the patriotic cookie. These MREs had some of the last sweet things you could find here in the wasteland. And even though they were dry and tasted a little metallic, they both enjoyed every last crumb. So what do you do now? I don't know. Maybe head north. I've heard it's green up there. Zinn closed her eyes. There's flowing rivers, trees that make fruit and syrup, and enough grass to feed all the cattle in the world. I've always wanted to go, but my parents wanted to stay here. It's a good life, they'd say. Best we could hope for. For all the good that did us. Mutt just looked at her. Once again, not sure what to say. But I'm not leaving until Zealot is dead and all the fucking blood backs if there was a way. Maybe you could stick with us for a while. You know, just until Zealot is dead. Maybe we can help. I wouldn't mind seeing him with a few holes in his chest myself. We'll see. They sat for a moment in silence. Mutt thought about the day when he first found the Dukes, or was it when we found him? He'd been orphaned himself after his parents both caught the fever. He was only 12, but old enough to bury them and fend for himself for a while. He'd moved from one small outlander settlement to another, offering to do odd jobs for food and water, but would often steal what he could and sneak out in the night. One day between towns, he came across a small band of dukes camped out during a gun-running mission to deliver an old vicar's machine gun to a group of scavers, led by an old-timer named Doc Schofield and his partner Digits. We didn't understand why they'd want such an old machine gun when there were plenty of late-century merchandise available, but Doc was specific, and he was willing to pay a fair price for the gun, every round of 303 ammo we had, which wasn't much, and a few small caliber weapons. When Mutt came across the small squad, there were three of us dukes hunkered down for the night in an abandoned garage, talking around a fire we built in the corner where the roof was collapsed, eating our MREs and enjoying the cool night, 
just a few steps away from our war buggy parked outside. It was me, makeshift, our money guy Wolf and his partner Spurs. Mutt managed to sneak up on us. He found the box of MREs in the back of the buggy and grabbed as much as he could carry before he snuck away 50 yards or so and started eating. He was quiet. None of us even knew we'd been robbed before he walked right back up to us, making his approach obvious this time. Stop there, or I'll shoot your fucking head off! I yelled out to his silhouette while aiming my modified pistol at him. Easy, makeshift. It's just a kid. Wolf was always the most even-tempered of us. Hey, buddy. What are you doing out here alone? The kid didn't say much. He just showed us an old small radio in his pocket and said he'd heard about the Dukes of the Nuke and the Wasteland Communication Corporation by scanning the channels as he traveled around. He was also very excited when he found out we knew Brother Justify. You hungry? Want something to eat? Looks like he already had some. Wolf pointed to an open MRE pouch sticking out of Mutt's pocket. <laughs> the kid's got skills. You just have to stick with us until you've paid off your debt. And with that, Mutt joined our crew for the rest of the trip to the meeting place set by the drifters. Our buggy only sat two in front and one on the top mounted machine gun, so Mutt had to ride either up front of the bumper or sit cramped beneath the gunner's feet where he'd have to hold a canister of fuel in his lap. So he elected to sit up front for most of the trip. The exchange with the drifters went smooth. They traded some ester, a box of medicine called Jet, and a few car batteries that would still hold a charge for the Duke's weapons. And Doc mentioned he would pay top dollar for any more 303 ammunition we came across. By the time we made it back to camp, Mutt was a full-fledged FNG, or fucking new guy, as it was called in the old world. Mutt snapped out of his daydream and saw Zin had laid back down, kind of awkwardly on the ground, with her head propped up on the rock again. She probably hadn't slept much in the last few days. He felt sorry for her, for whatever she went through since being captured, and for everything that happened before that, too. He just wanted to get her safe again. He pushed himself back against a rock, determined to let her sleep for a few minutes, while he promised himself not to doze off. Outside their little cave, he could hear the wind flowing through the canyon. The dry grasses sang a high-pitched squeal in the gusts. And far off in the distance, a dog barking. Mutt gently shook Zin to wake her up and motioned to her to keep quiet and stay low as he crept out of the small cave and around the bend of the trail made by the wash through the rocks. He poked his head out just enough to see down in the valley below were two of the bloodbacks and what looked like the same dog from the raider camp on a rope towing them along. Zin snuck up behind him and looked out. Oh fuck, they're on our trail. They both ran back to the rock cave and shoved the remains of their MRE meal back into Mutt's bag and ran as fast as they could up the wash, which quickly petered out to a stony trail, then to nothing. The last 20 yards or so were almost vertical, and they had to climb up from boulder to boulder to reach the crest of the hill between two rock peaks. They looked back and saw the raiders were just making the turn at the rock cave, somehow only 100 yards behind them, but climbing up the hillside was much slower than moving through the wash in the valley. Hopefully they'd be able to gain some distance as they head down the other side. The raiders looked up, spotting the two, the one holding the dog's rope released it, and the dog ran full speed up the hill toward Mutt and Zin. Zin took off running down the other side of the hill, but quickly saw that Mutt wasn't with her. She turned to see him just standing there at the top. Mutt, come on! Hold on! Mutt was still looking away from her and back down at the speeding dog with the two raiders now far behind it. The dog was only 20 yards away and climbing around the boulders when Mutt knelt down holding his last meat stick out. The dog stopped short, only a few feet away, growling, barking. Mutt split the stick in two and threw a piece, landing just under the dog's foaming jaws. The dog's eyes stayed trained on Mutt as he lowered his head to smell the stick, and quickly its whole demeanor changed. It grabbed the meat stick and swallowed it whole. Good boy, come here. The dog walked right up to Mutt like they'd always known each other. Mutt gave him the rest of the meat stick and patted him on the head. We've got to go. You want to come with us? We gotta go! The Ones Who Came Before was written, narrated, and directed by me, Mike Makeshift Darling. This episode featured Sean Cunningham as Mutt, Mallory Trinnell as Zinn, Kit Boyd playing himself as Wolf, 
and Kate Crownover playing herself as Spurs. Legends of Wasteland City is a production of the Apocalypse Post. Stick around after the break for more info about today's episode. Hey survivors, Makeshift here to remind you that the Apocalypse Post is brought to you in no small way by our Patreon supporters. Join the ranks for early access and exclusive content with support levels now named for fancy Fallout-ridden factions like the $2 per creation Drifter or the $7 Wastelander. Knowing you've got my back has helped me dedicate more time to this channel, spreading love of the post-apocalypse, and less time on stupid real-world stuff. Sign up right now at patreon.com slash the apocalypse post. All right, survivors, we got another episode in and we are halfway through this story, which this story was supposed to only have nine episodes, but I ended up going back and making it 10 because nine was ending in a major cliffhanger. And um, even though I don't think this story is going to be done, I wanted to get it to a place that really felt like it was a conclusion. So rather than leave you guys hanging for months and months after this season's over, we're going to kind of end this part of the story, even though I think that this world of Mutt, Zinn, and the rest of the Dukes is going to continue on. So um, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but when I described the MREs in this episode and in episode one, um, I go into a little bit extra detail about like what's in it, uh, what it included, what's exciting, what's not exciting. Uh, and actually that comes from my conversations I've actually had with people that were actually in the military or currently in the military. And it seems that the the MREs are always a hot topic of discussion. And I'm pretty fascinated by that, but I also get it because food's really important to me. And I can imagine if you're being based somewhere and your entire sustenance is MREs, um, it would become very important which one you got by chance and which dessert came with it. And I know that they're always talking about which dessert came with it. So I got a, I got a, I had a little bit of fun with the Patriotic Cookie in this episode. You know, we have a couple members of the Dukes that are military or ex-military. And uh, anytime we talk about Amory's, it's always just kind of a, a fun, fascinating conversation. And it's really interesting because we're talking about food that's stabilized to last for years, right? I think most of them say that they're supposed to only be shelf stable for two or 10 years or something short like that. But theoretically, they could last forever. Kind of like canned food, it's all theoretical. Um, even though there's expiration dates on there, if they're well taken care of, theoretically, they should just keep keep going. They won't taste good after 100 years, and I'm sure that these certainly don't. But um, anyway, I, I don't know if you guys picked up on that, but I think it's kind of fun. So in this one, we found out a little bit more about the backstory of the world that everyone's in. And um, it's really interesting because as we go through the legends of Wasteland City, as we hear different legends, we're going to hear different versions of the fall, right? Uh, everyone's kind of got their own story about what what happened and how the world ended. Um, of course, with all this going back to the event Wasteland Weekend, um, we have the Mad Max kind of fall, which is um, a societal collapse followed by the oil wars and then finally atomic wars. And so that's where the Mad Max world comes from. And then when you add in Fallout, we get a whole lot more of the atomic stuff um, along with some kind of like 50s era science, atomic science and and all that kind of stuff. So um, in this one, I kind of I kind of wanted to go into a little bit, but still leave it a touch vague to not add too many details because because as we go, I don't want to be like retconning anything. But um, but yeah, I think that the fall of man happening in stages and a lot of different things actually taking place kind of makes a lot of sense. So I hope you enjoyed that. And along with that, we also had Mutt's origin story about how he joined the Dukes. And that was actually an added scene because I've been trying to involve as many of the Dukes as possible. A couple of them were not written into the original script. And then um, I was trying to lengthen this this episode a little bit because a few of you out there keep asking for the episodes to be longer and uh, I'm just trying to add what I can I don't want to like go back and restructure this entire story but if I can add a scene here and there that's cool I'll do that uh, anyway I needed a couple extra dukes so uh, I offered them the part and they um, they offered to record themselves I think uh, the recording came out a little bit wonky we had a little trouble with the microphone however uh, I think it still works and because I'm the writer I was able to just write it into a garage and so that might you know explain away why the sound is a little different in there but 
<laughs> it's fun. I'm, I'm just working with what I got here, so bear with me. Let's see, what else? There was an Easter egg in here, kind of a, a Fallout-inspired thing. It's, it's Jet. Jet is one of the drugs that's available in the Fallout video games. I believe it makes you, like, extra powerful, extra fast. You can carry more things. It's like a superpower drug. Um, and the Schofields Drifters use that in their lore story. That was actually in their story from earlier this season. Uh, and I, so I wanted to include that again because um, it's just kind of fun to throw in these little things. Um, it doesn't have to be 100% original, right? We can kind of borrow and, and steal from other things. That's what they say. Good artists borrow, great artists steal. So I guess that makes me a great artist. And yeah, we're kind of in the calm before, well, I don't want to give anything away, but we're in the calm before the storm here. Uh, the next episode, things are going to get pretty crazy. And along with that, well, here's my confession, guys. I'm so far behind. I'm behind. And really what it comes down to, I've got the whole thing written, but I'm trying to track down a few more voices. We've got a few more voice actors that want to voice their own characters, and I'm trying to get, I'm actually shipping out a microphone. It's in the mail today to go out to one of the Dukes that doesn't have a good mic system, and he's going to try to record his lines if he can. I'll get the next episode out sooner, but um, there's a bunch of lines that I need to get still, so it might be a few weeks until we get this next episode out, and I'll take that time to get ahead on the rest of the episodes as well, so hopefully this will be the one big break that we'll take this season. But bear with me, I'm doing my best. Um, I definitely, when I was writing this story, way overcomplicated it. I, I put in too many characters, too many locations, too much going on, but I love it. And it's so much fun, and I hope you guys are enjoying it. Uh, in the meantime, I hope you guys are having a wonderful summer. Detonation just happened over in Arizona. It looked like everyone had fun. I think Atomic Falls was this past weekend. I hope everyone there had fun. We've gotten our first look behind the scenes of uh, Mad Max Furiosa. I guess it's just called Furiosa at this point. Uh, all it was was the was the uh, sound clapper, so we didn't get to see anything. No vehicles, no characters, no costumes. We don't even know who Hemsworth is playing yet, but he's the one that put the picture of the slate up on his Instagram. It confirms almost nothing other than we're shooting there. Well, they're shooting on 35 millimeter film, so very exciting there. Anything else? Any other news? I don't think so. I did just today, today being Monday, June something, June 6th. I did just pick up six of the Wasteland Weekend 2021 event maps. This is the drone shot I put together with all the streets and, and, and tribes named. Uh, I just picked it up from the Laminators. I've got five of these left. So I already sold one, which is why I got it done. I've got five of these things. And uh, so basically it just takes that same map that I've been selling on my website, which is the apocalypsepost.square.site, uh, except it laminates it. So it'll be good forever. Cause you know, some people want that stuff to last forever. <laughs> <laughs> but if you want a laminated version, I tried to keep the price as low as possible and actually getting six of them at once helped that. Um, but uh, it's pretty cool and it, it makes the poster look just that much better. But um, yeah, check it out. Uh, it's up in the website, the, uh, the, the links below. I hope you guys are enjoying the show. Subscribe wherever you're listening, if you haven't, whether it's on a podcast channel or on the YouTube. Do share this with your friends. I'd actually like to challenge everybody out there to go ahead and share this on your social media. Uh, just talk about the show. Leave a little note. Tell everyone why you listen and why you love this show. And just share a link to wherever you're listening so that people can discover it. We're still definitely trying to get more and more people involved in the show and listening to the show and involved in the community. Uh, and by you guys sharing is the number one way that that happens because people trust their friends and you've got friends and your friends want to be friends with the show. Yeah. Just go with it. Anyway, that's it for this week, Survivors, so thanks for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. If you hated it, share it with an enemy, along with a cling-wrapped cookie that tastes just a little bit metallic. I'll see you next time, Survivors. Stay alive. Mm -hmm.